You are listening to Social Europe Podcast. We discuss cutting-edge thinking on politics, economy and employment and labour with some of the most thought-provoking people around, including Nobel Prize winners and other internationally acclaimed experts. So welcome and enjoy the conversation. This episode of Social Year Podcast is brought to you by the Zaid Business School, University of Oxford. The Oxford Executive MBA enables current and future business leaders to make a difference in their chosen field. The part-time program is designed to fit alongside your work commitments and offers you a global network. Visit the Zaid Business School, University of Oxford website for further details. Okay, David Otter, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to uh, talk to me today about you know, jobs, automation, the past uh, of jobs, the, the present of jobs and where we are going. And just, so, uh, you know, as a, as a warm up for, for people who might not be up to speed with, uh, you know, the recent discussions. Um, you know, fear of automation has been a historic feature of technological uh, advancement. And uh, has, it, has it ever been warranted or, you know, what, what would you see as the history of automation and its impact on labor markets? I, well, it, it certainly it has it has a long history, and I would I would I would say it's always been warranted, uh, in a way, but usually not the way people think. Uh, the it usually the concern you know is expressed in terms of the elimination of all work and the idea that there will be no more employment, and uh, and this has cropped up at various points in history. Uh, you know, many people refer to the Luddite rebellion of uh, you know British weavers. Um, but you don't have to look that far back. Uh, you know, this was a concern in the United States before even the Great Depression. The U.S. Secretary of Labor, uh, James Davis, was concerned about the so-called scrapping of men, where he was referring to, you know, scrapping like what you would do with machines. Uh, or even after the Second World War, uh, President Johnson started the um, Commission on, uh, on Productivity and Employment, Blue Ribbon Commission, and the fear there was actually that productivity was growing so fast that there would be insufficient labor demand. Uh, and so it was a, a concern about a shortfall of demand. So I don't think there – so I think there's been many points in history. Um, I think what they have been wrong about so far is the idea that there were just – we would run out of work, uh, that people would be rendered useless. And that has – nothing close to that has occurred. However, there's another concern that I think is much uh, better grounded, which is that it will, ha it will be very disruptive for some and create you know, uh, a concentrated set of people who are made worse off by automation because their skills and livelihoods have been devalued. And that's happened many times. Uh, and that did happen during the Industrial Revolution. That did happen with the skilled weavers that in some sense they were made redundant. Uh, there was a lot of productivity growth uh, in weaving, in textiles, but it didn't redound to work, work to rising wages for you know four to six decades, uh, and so you know it probably contributed to rising living standards among people who bought those materials and so on. But it didn't actually uh, it essentially replaced artisanal labor with a lot of sweatshop labor, a lot of children working in uh, in uh, you know in mills and textile mills. Um, so I think that's a you know completely legitimate concern, and so. It's easy to sort of, you know, say, oh, these people, don't they know? Haven't they read the history? Everyone always gets worried about it. It always turns out fine. But I don't think it's – that's. I think that's too simple. Uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't turn out fine for everybody. And sometimes it turns out better than others because of, you know, policies uh, that we've, we've enacted or investments that we've made to help people adapt. So, you know, in the early 20th century, when the U.S. was moving very, very rapidly out of agriculture – uh, U.S. states uh, independently, many of them made the decision to uh, uh, require uh, children to remain in school until the age of 16, what was called the so-called high school movement. And that was a very costly decision to make because, uh, you know, not only did you have to build buildings and hire teachers and buy books, but children couldn't work on the farm during that time. Uh, and it was considered, uh, you know, at the time kind of a radical step because it wasn't obvious why everyone needed to be both literate and numerate, and to have that relatively high level of education, it turned out to be a very wise investment. It allowed people, arguably gave the U.S. kind of a uh, one of the most flexible and productive and versatile workforces in the world. Um, and that helped with the process of movement out of industry, uh, sorry, out of agriculture and into industry and into services. Um, but that didn't happen on its own. 
So you know, many people look at that period in history and say, oh, it all worked out great. Don't worry about it. But it didn't work out great by accident. <laughs> so it was it was politically steered. And we'll, we'll come back to that uh, yeah, towards absolutely. the end. I mean, would you then say that it is a, a fair characterization that, you know, the fear that you're running out of work is, is literally unwarranted, but there's always been transitional pains and, uh, uh, and transitions that have been harder for certain people and easier for others? Well, I... Uh, I don't want to say the fear is unwarranted. The fear has never been proven out. There's never been a period where we have run out of work because of automation. Um, however, we, you know, we, there's no proof that that couldn't possibly occur, uh, but we haven't seen it happen. And there's no evidence that it's happening right now. Right? We are in a kind of a worldwide jobs boom uh, in the industrialized world. Um, now, a lot of that has to do with demographics, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it's uh, we're not running short on jobs. Um, but it's certainly almost always warranted uh, to be thinking, well, if you know the required skill sets are changing fast, if things that I've been doing are now done by machines, it's not obvious that you know that's a good outcome for me. <laughs> uh, and certainly, so we should expect to see disruption. And the disruption, uh, you know, in the last uh, four or five decades, especially the last three, has been most concentrated among the less educated. Mm -hmm. who have you know high school or lower education in particular uh, and in the u.s we've seen a real decline in earnings especially among high school educated men yeah and uh, interestingly i mean also the labor market uh sort of trade of that john Maynard keynes predicted did also not come about so we didn't trade uh basically working hours for more leisure time that didn't seem that prediction didn't seem to come true would you agree with that it's actually quite multifaceted. So among the less educated, we do see more leisure, less work, uh, but also not very high wages. Uh, and arguably, people have insufficient work. They're not working as much as they want to. Among the highly educated, we see just the reverse. Uh, they have tons and tons of income and consumption, but they work extremely long hours. And the correlation between annual earnings and hours worked, or you know, sorry, hourly wages and hours worked per year uh, has gotten far, far steeper and stronger in the United States over the last 35 years. Uh, back in the 1970s, uh, the highly paid individuals only worked a little bit more uh, per uh, per year than did lower paid individuals. And you, know, you could easily imagine it would have been the reverse, actually, the lower your pay, the more you had to work. At this point, uh, people of very high earnings levels are often, you know, they're overemployed. They, you know, they they don't just do one job. They do one and a half or two jobs. They they wish they could work only sixty hours a week, <laughs> but they're working eighty. <laughs> but uh, because probably their skill set is so specialized that it's not easy to split these jobs into into different parts. And uh, even though the productivity is is low at the lower end, um, you know, there might not be just enough work to go around. Or is yeah, it is yeah. it a choice to go for at lower the low hours? End, often there's there's kind of excess labor supply. And firms don't want to hire workers full time because they prefer to, you know, have partial benefits and uh, and you know just kind of keep people on a contingent basis, depending on what are demand conditions at the store or at the restaurant. At the high end, there's two things. I mean, one is that many of these jobs have so-called indivisibilities, meaning that you know you can't just take a you know a big legal case and split it down the middle among two people. Uh, it kind of requires one mind to be fully wrapped around it. The other is that there's just been a, there's uh, there's so much demand for highly skilled individuals are not producing them fast enough. And so if you can't move, improve them on the extensive margin, i.e. the number, you increase them on the intensive margin, i.e. the number of hours that they work. And so that, I think you know, it's related to rising wages for the highly educated. Uh, it, you know, that reflects scarcity. And that scarcity you know, causes people to have higher pay and, higher, you know, and a greater probability of being employed. But then if someone being employed, they work more hours. Mm. And, uh, you know, would you say that the tendency or the trend that you identified in your previous research, the, the sort of polarization, the dumbbell model uh, of, of the labor market, uh, you know, is that continuing? I mean, your, 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 your latest uh, work seems to make a distinction between frontier jobs and yeah. uh, wealth jobs, um, yeah. whereas wealth jobs are basically low skilled service sector, personal services related jobs and frontier jobs are really the, the, the jobs you seem to just have described, you know, where uh, a very specialized skill set is needed and there are indivisibility issues at hand. Yeah, so the, the work that you're describing is, is ongoing work with Anna Salomons of uh, Utrecht University. And there we try to characterize some of the new work that's emerging. 
Uh, and that's not all work. It's just the new job titles are being created. And this is uh, based on building on an approach that's developed by Jeff Lynn, who's an economist at the uh, Philadelphia Federal Reserve Bank. And uh, yeah, we looking at, you know, and this is that's very uh, preliminary, but uh, certainly uh, tantalizing and suggestive. We look at um, uh, when you look at these new titles that are populated by the Census Bureau every decade. Uh, and, and how do these come about, by the way? Well, they come about because the Census Bureau asks people what they do, and then they try to classify them. But if enough people say something that they haven't heard before, they kind of create a new title for that thing. So, you know, like a job that appeared in the U.S. Census in 2000 is the barista, or in 2010 is the sommelier. Now, these are not, this is not new work, right? Obviously, there have been baristas uh, for as long as there's been Italy, uh, but and sommeliers for as long as there's been France, I, I have to presume. But... Uh, but enough people were doing them in the United States as a, a career that you know, that now gets specifically and separately enumerated. So looking at those lists of new titles, what you see is it's you know like about 40% of them roughly uh, are maybe a little bit less are what we call frontier jobs. These are the ones these are the ones that involve working with the new technology or translating the new technology. So you could be a, a robot integrator, you could be a radiological uh, medicine specialist, you could be someone who, you know, is a, a you know, a search engine optimizer. So you're kind of working with the new stuff. Um, but another a, a larger fraction over half by our uh, measure or what we call a uh, wealth work jobs. These are jobs that are not pro technologically progressive in any sense, uh, but they often involve uh, high end luxuries and services for people, uh, you know, who probably many of them who are doing the frontier work and making a good amount of money. So uh, things like, you know, a horse exerciser, an indoor gardener, uh, uh, an oyster preparer, <laughs> uh, sommelier, um, barista. And uh, those tend to be clustered around the places where we see all this frontier work where there's a lot of money and you know i mean like yoga studios are a very very rapidly growing uh area you know industry in the united states from a small base obviously but uh it's probably haven't been a lot of technological breakthroughs in yoga in the last millennium or so uh they're mostly you know that's coming from consumption patterns of the affluent uh, so yeah so the, and they going back to your question about polarization you could say those jobs are fairly polarized in the sense that you know, one is, you know, highly educated, highly paid, and the other, many of these services, uh, they're moderately educated, uh, they're, they're, and they bet they're about average or below average pay. And an interesting distinction between them in our data is that these frontier jobs are, are disproportionately male or done by men. And the wealth jobs are disproportionately done by women, uh, really, you know, very heavily. So, you know, two thirds of the wealth work that we see, uh, appears to be done by women. Two thirds of the frontier work or more appears to be done by men. And the women in these wealth jobs are more educated than average. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, they tend to be, so you, you might imagine like, you know, college educated women who are working in restaurants and yoga studios and, you know, entertainment and recreation. Uh, so it's, it's a, certainly a mixed picture. And the uh, it's not... Um, it's not clear that those wealth work jobs have a, you know, a really strong career trajectory, right? That they, you know, you're sort of, that you build skills and expertise and become more specialized over time, things that kind of lead to uh, wage growth over the course of a career. And, and I think is that, you know, this points to a, you know, a sort of a, a very simple way to say this is, you know, we have lots and lots of jobs right now. For highly educated workers, we have lots and lots of great careers. For less educated workers, we have lots and lots of employment opportunities, but very few good careers, uh, and arguably less than we used to have. Uh, because pre in our, uh, you know, a couple decades back, many more non-college workers were doing either manufacturing production work or were doing office clerical admin work, both of which are things at which you become more specialized over time. You develop a specific school skill set that's, you know, valuable to your employer that depends on knowledge of a specific machine or knowledge of the group of people with whom you work and the work processes of that organization. And so you're not immediately replaceable with the next person who applies for your job. But if you're doing cleaning, security, food service, home health aid, you know, driving a vehicle, um, you know, uh, entertainment recreation, it's not obvious that you become a great deal more productive or specialized at those things over the course of a, you know, a decade or two decades. And so in some sense, you be, you're, if that's not the case, you're, you're more replaceable. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and that will tend to you know, reduce wage growth, reduce job security uh, over the career path. And so that's, uh, I think, a big challenge is the declining career paths for less educated adults. So there are basically two uh, pressure points at, and, uh, you know, in, in this segment, if I, if I get you right. I mean, the first one is the threat of automation that we already talked before. But on the other hand, uh, this is also you're quite easily replaceable with other human workers uh, because there's no specialization, special skill set. Um, you know, you basically pr you feel the pressure from, from both ends. That's right. And I, I think that's the, that's the kind of paradox of the growth of service work, of service occupations, which we see in many countries, especially among the less educated, you know, they do less office work, they do less production, they do more personal services. That work at, at the moment is is really pretty hard to automate uh, because it requires dexterity, it requires flexibility, it requires common sense, it requires sightedness, it requires flexible interactions and communications with people. So you'd say, wow, it's you know really hard for machines to do, it ought to be really valuable. But it's not actually very scarce because most people can do it without you know much training uh, or you know certification. So that work tends to be numerous and can grow pretty rapidly without a lot of wage growth, except in a very tight labor market when people have to be compensated to do that as opposed to whatever other thing they were doing. Uh, and so like in the U.S. right now, we do see strong wage growth at the bottom of the distribution in those jobs reflecting the very tight labor market. But throughout the decade of the 2000s, we saw a lot of growth in those jobs without any wage growth. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, that's the... Um, that is the that is the paradox. So the fact that something is hard to automate, uh, you know, hard to have machines do, doesn't mean it's going to pay a high wage. Uh, it depends what is the supply of people who can do it as well. And supply to those jobs is likely to be pretty elastic uh, because you know there's a there's a large potential skill set of people who can do it. And the question is, will they want to do it? And it depends what else they could be doing. Now, you know, one positive you know, underlying force that's kind of working in favor of improving working conditions in that type of work is that, you know, cohorts are getting much smaller. You know, birth rates are falling throughout the industrialized world. Um, so there'll be fewer people, fewer young people are going to come in and do, you know, manual, physically demanding service labor. And two, education rates are rising. In the U.S., education rates are actually rising quite rapidly, college-going rates and college completion rates among younger cohorts, something we haven't seen in a long time, actually. And that means that you, there'll be fewer people who are going to be interested in doing that work. So again, that creates, uh, you know, that reduces labor supply to that set of activities, and that will cause wages to grow. I mean, it'll also cause products to be more expensive, and it'll cause, you know, service to be worse to restaurants and so on. But it's good for labor. <laughs> it also, by the way, is a driver of automation. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a point that you know, Drone Asimoglu and Pascal Restrepo, Pascal Restrepo have pointed out that. You know, a lot of the, you know, where do we see robots being used most intensively? They're in countries that actually have rapidly aging populations. So, you know, Germany, Korea, Japan, uh, the U.S. less so, but the U.S. actually is, is comparatively young among industrialized countries. And China, which has now has a huge, uh, you know, uh, the has a baby, the one child dividend, uh, sorry, the one child dividend has turned into one child deficit at this point. Right now, they are running out of young people much more rapidly than other countries because of the very small cohorts that the one-child policy created. And uh, so interestingly, so we have basically four uh, different um, trends at play at the lower end of the labor market. So you've got the, the potential of automation and the oversupply or big supply of, of people who could actually do these jobs. And at the same time, you have two balancing factors, which is the increasing level of education on average. And at the same time, demographic changes tend, will tend to reduce the supply in this segment right. of the labor market. And, you know, you see this like very intensively in agriculture, right? There's all kinds of, you know, every day you read about uh, new attempts at agricultural robotics, right? So in the UK, there's this thing called a robocrop, uh, which is a robotic strawberry picker that, you know, in theory is going in, going to be in the field, literally. Uh, you know, Well, they might uh, need it after Brexit. That's right. That's exactly. Well, that's just it. They're responding to declining immigration. Uh, and, and high wages. And, you know, that's very, very labor intensive work. Now, it's a really hard problem. You can't, in general, you can't just send robots in the field uh, to, to do what people are doing. You have to re-engineer the, the farm to make it happen. You have to make the, the plants much more consistent. You may have to change the genetics or, you know, grow different plants uh, such that they, uh, you know, that, 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 that there's not as much variety. Um, 
and the you know the the machines may have to have data on every single plant and what it's been fed and how long so they because they may not be able to visually inspect accurately about whether the fruit is ripe or not they may have to infer that from all the data that is there and another thing is they actually have a huge amount of trouble dealing with changing light conditions outdoors uh you know, one of the great uh, there was a great quotation in this New Yorker article about you know robots and farming, and one of the scientists remarks, you know, if you're worried about the robots, you know, that are coming for you, just leave your porch light on. The light really confuses them. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so anyway, but yeah, so the the and we'll see more of that. I mean, we'll see you know we'll see more robotics in uh, in agriculture, and eventually we'll see more robotics in you know in food service, in cleaning, certainly in security. Uh, and so on. Um, it, but, you know, at the moment, it's those problems are hard. The machines are expensive. They don't do that well. Uh, and and labor is still pretty cheap. So a lot of, you know, a good chunk of the pace of that type of automation, I think, is being driven uh, by, you know, uh, pressure from labor scarcity. And you already not so much the case in AI and so on. Yeah, and you already mentioned the the case of of, uh, of different countries. I mean, your research, as I understand it, applies mostly to the United States. So do you That's see? Right. It's been pretty focused on the US. Okay. Do do you see different trends in different countries? Um, I mean, in Germany, for instance, it seems to be uh, less the case uh, that you have this kind of polarization uh, in the labor market, which might have to do with the, how the political economy is set up. Um, so what, what is, is what is your overview basically over how yeah. these trends play out elsewhere? Sure. I mean, Ger you know, Germany, so it's different in every country. There are certain similarities, some, certain differences. We do see, a, you know, occupational polarization in most of the of the EU. And this is goes to work by Goose and Manning and Solomons. Um, Germany is unusual that it's maintained a very large manufacturing base. Um And, uh, and so that has, you know, kept more of the middle skill blue collar work than you find in other countries. Uh, Germany has had a big rise of inequality and fall in wages at the bottom and so on. So it's not been immune, but it's, you know, many other things have worked well there. Uh, and, um, the, uh, and of course, you know, trade has also played an important role in this, right? Part of the reason that Germany has, you know, uh, you know, had such large, uh, continued to hit. To have such a large manufacturing presence has been a, a very big exporter, especially to China, uh, and that has worked really well. And the U.S. has been much more on the importer side, and that has led to a more rapid erosion of manufacturing employment that you might see elsewhere. Um, so there are there are certainly differences, and they don't all you know translate into the same degree of inequality. Uh, so the U.S. has you know uh, where many countries are you know to some extent buffeted by these common forces, but they have different, very different institutional responses in terms of labor standards, education policy, tax policy. So the U.S. is at a, a fairly extreme position of having an extremely unequal level of education. So we have, you know, extremely, extraordinarily broad skill sets, very few labor protections. Uh, and so, uh, ex uh, and very, and not especially progressive taxation. So the gap between pre and post tax inequality in the U.S. is much smaller than in many other countries. It's not that tax policy doesn't do anything to reverse market forces, but not as much as, as you would see in Germany or in the Nordic states or in France. Uh, so uh, there are real differences. And, and one very interesting aspect uh, in, your, in your most recent work that I, that I found is that you also looked at the geography within countries. And That's I think right. there's, a, there's a very obvious correlation with how politics is playing out at the moment, not just in the US, but also in, in other Western countries. So, I mean, this, this kind of old sort of center periphery model uh, is, is being reinforced by these trends, isn't it? Well, so my work is only on my work on the geography. Of this is so far only on the United States, although I'm I'm you know studying other countries now. But uh, the what I can say is what I found in the U.S. Uh, in my recent work really surprised me, which is you know I've been studying this kind of decline of middle skill occupations and the kind of rate of the tails, growing rate of the tails for quite some time, and uh, I had sort of always considered that assumed that was kind of a uniform phenomenon. Wherever you looked, that's what was happening. You know, if you looked in the suburb or in a rural area or in a metro area or a city, kind of be the same pattern. Maybe even be more extreme uh, outside of cities and inside of cities. And it turns out that that kind of presumption was just actually not at all correct. Um, what what was the case in the United States 
uh, you know, looking from the 1970s forward, certainly, was that as you went from kind of, you know, rural areas to suburbs to metro areas to cities, um, you saw big differences in the type of work that non-college workers did. So uh, as you kind of move up the population density gradient, you'd also be moving up a kind of an occupational gradient where non-college workers were, you know, less likely to be found in services and in manual labor and much more likely to be found either in manufacturing or in office admin clerical work. And, uh, and so the type of work that non-college people did in cities was really different. And they pay, got paid a lot more for doing that, uh, even just in for cost of living. And then from 1980 to present, but especially after 1990, you see kind of an unwinding of that gradient. So that there's no longer any difference in the type of work that, at a high level that non-college workers do in cities versus metro areas versus suburbs versus rural areas they're all now found in services you know in food service cleaning health care home health care uh, security entertainment recreation transportation uh and um and so uh that as, and as that has occurred as that kind of unwinding of this particular you know gradient in occupations for non-college workers as that has unwound the urban wage premium among non-college workers has really dramatically decline. Uh, so, you know, it used to be, if you look at the 1950s, 1970s, you know, wages were just rising very steeply in population density. They're much higher in cities than in metro areas, than in suburbs and in rural areas. Partly that reflects cost of living, but partly it also reflects higher productivity there. Um, and, uh, and then over the last 25 years, the wage premium seen among college-educated workers has gotten only steeper. Uh, in urban areas, there's been greater what people would call agglomeration. And then it's unwound for non-college workers, such that the urban wage premium, you know, net of cost of living, it's not even clear it's positive any longer for the less educated. Um, and that's really, you know, a, a really surprising change that I didn't expect to see, but is very, very clear. Um, uh, once you, you know, once I uh, looked uh, closely at the data, now it's important to stress that the fraction of people who are quote non-college has declined substantially over time. So this is a you know a subset of people at this point. You know, uh, high school or lower workers comprise you know f maybe four out of ten of every hour is worked. So they've gone from being a majority to a minority, although a substantial minority. So it's not to say that everything's getting worse or that even for the modal or the median or the average person, the things are you know, job op opportunities are declining, wages are declining. But a substantial minority uh, are definitely experiencing that very strongly in diminished occupational horizons. And of course, it means that, yeah, within cities, you see a clustering of highly educated, high wage, relatively young, actually, compared to historically, uh, uh, folks. And they're doing great and they're, you know, really kind of benefiting from all of the new technology and the opportunities it presents. And then there's a stratum of workers within urban areas who are less educated and they basically are there to, you know, see to the care and comfort and transportation and, you know, physical needs of the affluent and educated. And then once you get so outside of those areas, uh, there's just much, much less of this kind of frontier work uh, and populations are getting older. Uh, and life isn't changing as fast, except for the sense that you're not a part of <laughs> this dynamism. So it's interesting. I mean, when I was still living in London, there was exactly the same problem that, you know, in the most expensive areas in London, they had trouble getting cleaners, um, yeah. you know, uh, people removing rubbish, uh, you know, low skilled service sector uh, jobs, people, uh, you know, uh, fulfilling these functions actually in because they had to live so far away for cost reasons, mainly uh, yeah. that it was uh, they were almost unable to get there on, on, on public transport. So, uh, I mean, gentrification of the cities might be might be. Uh, do you have any idea what the drivers are yet or? Uh, I, you know, I, I, th I mean, there are a number of drivers and I don't know for sure if I were to speculate, I would say probably the primary driver, I think, is the sort of growing agglomeration of skilled activities in cities that, that they seem to, you know, all the, in this quote era of death of distance, proximity seems to be becoming more, not less important for the highly skilled, you know, being at the right university at the right 
you know, right teaching hospital in Silicon Valley around other engineers or in New York around other financiers or in Los Angeles around other movie makers. That seems to be becoming, you know, more important, not less important. So that has kind of driven a lot of, you know, highly paid people into dense areas and they push up prices a lot. Uh, the alongside that, um, in general, uh, especially in the United States, uh, cities have gotten a lot safer. Uh, there are a lot better places to live. So, you know, one one reason that highly educated adults would tend to leave urban areas as they hit their kind of prime working years is they could move out to suburbs where schools were better, safety was, uh, you know, improved, and you know, the, and also there wasn't all the great food in cities to keep them there, at least in the U.S. Uh, and so, um, it's the kind of the push factors that push people out of cities. Uh, among the highly paid, high, highly educated have kind of abated. And I think, you know, a long part and parcel of that, and this is not a coincidence, uh, fertility has fallen and the age of fertility has risen. So that makes it easier for, you know, uh, prime age working adults to stay in cities because, you know, they don't need as much space <laughs> and they don't need uh, the great schools. And so it's easier for them to stay there. So I think those things have really contributed to the pricing pressure. Uh, and then uh, the fact that non-college workers, you know, are now kind of shunted out of these middle skill activities means that part of the wage benefit or the wage escalator that they might have gotten on being in an urban area is declining. Now, eventually, look, if people in cities want to have, you know, restaurants and they want to have clean houses and they want to have transportation and they want to have security, they're going to have to pay, you know, higher wages for that work. It's just going to you, I, we may be in kind of a disequilibrium period, right, where people are, you know, the people who do those jobs are saying they can't afford to live there. Uh, eventually, uh, the highly educated are going to have to, you know, pay them enough that they can live there or find or do without or automate more. Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny, isn't it? It turns out that telework does not replace uh, personal networks and social interaction after all. Uh No, 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 not for the not so, you know, it's, it appears to be a compliment rather than a substitute at this point. Right. So, you know, if you work with someone remotely in another country, chances are you'll be going to visit them, you know, within a year to like do some in-person stuff. And I mean, one, you know, and maybe that will change. Right. Maybe the technology will improve so much that that will no longer be necessary. But one thing is you're not going to meet people by happenstance you know, on your computer monitor, right? Like I have a great monitor on my wall. I interact with lots of co-authors on that monitor. I have my, but I never just happen to meet someone on my screen and say, hey, what what are you thinking about? Let's, you know, <laughs> Let's write a paper search. together, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, so you know, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I think you'll, you'll see a lot more kind of mixed, you know, where people commute in into high density areas for a couple of days a week, then they work from home other days. And right, and I think it, a lot of people do a kind of a, Uh, a mixture of the two, but most, I don't think yet, is it feasible to pursue a super high-end career out in the middle of, you know, a rural area just over the internet. Yeah, well, that's certainly true. I and mean, before we come to the policy uh, implications that I'm uh, particularly interested in, I mean, the, the next, if you talk about the last 30 years was globalization, then digitization, yeah. and the next big thing seems to be quantum computing and applications that might come online or might not come online in the next yeah. five to 10 years. I mean, do you see any specific features of quantum computing that could change this sort of uh, equilibrium or it, would it be just be digitization on steroids? Well, quantum computing will create, will definitely change things. I, I'm not sure so much in this domain, like for the first thing it will do is they'll break all cryptography instantly. Okay, so, well I ask you because you're at MIT. I mean, you're probably the yeah, best economist the day, to ask about this. <laughs> the day quantum computing, you know, becomes viable is the day like every security mechanism we currently use for digital technologies like instantly the locks are wide open. Uh, so that itself is a problem. Um, but uh, I think, it, but setting aside quantum computing per se, I, what we don't know, what we know much, much less about uh, are the sort of rate of progress and capabilities of, you know, uh, artificial intelligence as opposed to robotics. Like robotics faces all kinds of, you know, real engineering challenges, right, that, you know, are very incremental in their solutions. Uh, but things that are just live on software and computers and don't have to have a physical embodiment, you know, can accelerate, can potentially improve much faster. And we don't know how fast they'll improve and what they'll be able to do. And, you know, when I say we, I don't really mean myself, 
I'm just an observer, but uh, even the people, people in this field are, you know, a very, very, there's a, you know, a vigorous debate and a wide range of opinions about how fast things will progress and are progressing. People in Silicon Valley sort of think, you know, it'll all be done by, you know, 2025, you know, like everything, all problem solved. Uh, you know, many more academics are very, you know, cognizant of the limitations uh, that the, the, you know, machines are really, really effective in certain types of environments. And what, it, what you might call a, a kind of learning environment, which is an environment where you get, there's a, a well-defined set of rules, you get instant feedback. Uh, it's very conducive to learning because if you make the right choice, you get a reward. If you make the wrong choice, you get a punishment, et cetera. Like that'd be like playing a game of chess, for example, uh, versus a kind of a, what some call a cruel learning environment, which is one where reinforcement is, you know, rare, it, you know, doesn't come frequently, can be highly misleading, uh, can lead to the wrong inference, right? You could go down, you know, the 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 right answer might require you to take a hundred steps that appear wrong before you get to the right outcome, and ha that's a very difficult learning environment. So people are good in that environment, right, because they have lots of ability to kind of learn from small data, right? From you know the, the broad panoply of experience, a little bit of information, they can often make big intellectual leaps. Uh, but um, so we just don't know, I don't know, and I think computer scientists don't know, you know, what will be feasible over the next decade and whether we'll kind of hit the flat of the curve with like sort of, you know, kind of annoyingly uh, dense, you know, voice activated devices that never really do what you want them to do. Uh, or whether, you know, we'll have machines that are, you know, developing, you know, what we would call new ideas and designing products and developing insights and, you know, things that we think are exclusive domain at this point. So we basically, even, even the experts don't know what happens when uh, quantum computing processing power will hit uh, self-learning algorithms. I, I, I mean, I think many of them think that, you know, that will help, right? That a lot of the progress, uh, you know, a lot of the progress in, of AI over the last, couple of decades has really come from a set of tools that were around decades earlier, uh, but were thought to be not very effective. And it turned out they were actually pretty good. It's just that we didn't have the processing power to make them usable. And now with the processing power and storage available, those tech tools appear to be pretty good. They're kind of brute force, uh, but they, they work well enough. If you can run the algorithm fast enough, you have enough storage, enough, uh, enough, uh, you know, CPU cycles. Um, so quantum computing would certainly accelerate that, but it's still a question of whether uh, that doesn't mean, uh, you know, you can pedal your bicycle as fast as you want. It's not going to fly, right? Uh, so it's not clear that this thing will fly once we can, you know, hit it with, you know, quantum pedals. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, there may be other things that are required. Well, uh, interestingly, I mean, uh, when, we, when we just finish on the policy uh, questions, I mean, one of the well, central factors is um, that, you know, we've been working on uh, here uh, to an extent is the, the idea of work has been under pressure now for, for the best part of 30 years. I mean, first was the globalization debate, you know, work, you know, how much will be outsourced, how much uh, wage pressure do we import, basically. Uh, then there's the digitization debate. So work has been seen as very much on the, on the defensive. But, you know, the, the one bit that pretty much all experts seem to agree on is that uh, the work of the future, the human work of the future, is much, much less reliant on routine tasks and much more reliant on uh, problem-solving skills, social skills and creative skills. These happen to be transformative powers. So if you design uh, work, the work of the future, in, in a way that you maximize uh, this transformative, this transformative potential, you might be able to actually put this, this to good use to solve some of the biggest social um, and um, environmental problems. So, uh, you know, labor could be actually turned into a very effective policy tool itself. Um, so, so that seems to be a, a different kind of uh, policy framework. Would you, would you agree with that kind of type of typization or? Yeah, I think the potential is enormous. I think the, the challenges are distributional ones. They're not ones of potential. It's not, you know, these technologies, you know, first of all, they don't work for themselves. They work for us. They're not going to get rich without us. We get rich based on them. And we can use them in all kinds of ways, right? We could use them to you know, give ourselves more leisure. We could use them to, uh, you know, fight more effective wars. I'm not saying we should, right? We could use them to reduce our carbon footprint, or we could use them to, you know, consume ever bigger machines that increase our carbon footprint. 
Uh, and so these are kind of social and political choices. And though that's where the challenges lie. So, you know, we're getting lots of GDP, uh, but um, it's, you know, it's the, the recipients of it are highly concentrated. Uh, you know, gl global warming is not a technological problem any longer. It's an economic problem. Right. It's not that we don't know what we could do about it or couldn't possibly do it. It's really it's a political and incentive problem to organize around, you know, solving this huge tragedy of the commons. Um, so I don't think there's anything intrinsically problematic about these technologies, they, but they challenge us to, uh, you know, they challenge our existing systems and require us to you know, create institutions that allow us to harness the benefits and minimize the harms. And it's not so clear that we're really up for that. <laughs> yeah. And in, in many cases, the institutions appear to be eroding uh, even faster than the technologies are, you know, improving. Yeah. And, and obviously the distribution aspect that you mentioned, it, it also depended on ownership, isn't it? I mean, if, if it's... Well, and see, the, the, the thing is that, you know, a lot, when uh, a lot of our income distribution comes from ownership of labor. Right. Everybody, you know, you're born with a hopefully a you know functioning mind and body. You go to school for some years, you learn some skills, and then you sell those to the market for 35 years, and then you have you know you have enough income to retire or savings to retire, and that's a good deal. Uh, the issue is that the you know labor of some has become incredibly scarce, and they make you know fabulous uh, livings and so on. But there's another good chunk of people whose labor is some some sense become less scarce, even though there are fewer of them, because they have many more machine substitutes. And so the kind of security that comes from ownership of labor arguably is declining for those individuals. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, if it's all capital income or ownership of capital or cap ownership of IP, well, that's very much more concentrated than ownership of labor. Uh, and uh, especially in a, an era where we do not allow slavery. Uh, so um, that is, I think, the, you know, the challenge that we face and really you know, we tend to have this conceit among the highly educated, our work has been so transformed by the tools we use, look at my smartphone, look at my big screen, right, et cetera, look at my color printer. But in fact, really our work, the tools that we use have been, have changed. Like I don't, you know, write on paper and pencil anymore. I use computer, I use spreadsheet, I don't invert matrices by hand. I use a, you know, a statistical package and so on. But fundamentally the work that I do or would someone like me would have done 40 years ago really isn't that different. However, for people who are lower levels of education, it's not that the tools have changed, it's that the tools have displaced them from the type of work they did. They're not actually doing manufacturing work. They're not actually doing, you know, typing and filing and sorting, calculating, phone answering in offices, right? They're doing a completely different type of work. They're doing in-person services. Uh, and so they, their work has really been transformed, but not necessarily for the better. Mm. Uh, and so that is, I think, that that kind of bifurcation of opportunity creates real, uh, you know, real political and social and economic challenges that we are you know, grappling with more or less successfully. And, uh, you know, the final question, if you look at all the sort of issues we, we touched upon from the distributional questions, from uh, the questions of, you know, problems of the planet, from uh, impact on labor markets, from new technologies that might or might not come online uh, any, anytime soon. If you were a policymaker and, and, and should, you know, create a, a sort of framework that is, is capable of preparing society uh, for, for these changes, where, where would you start? What would be your top three priorities as a policymaker? Sure. Well, I mean, I would always start with education, right? The, the sort of the giving people the skills to be flexible, creative, analytical, uh, and broad, that's, you know, has you know, just become more and more important over time. And those are the people, people who have those skills are doing well. Uh, so that's always, we should be investing there. Uh, second, you know, I think we should be, you know, taking the edge off the the kind of extremes of the market through appropriate taxation and appropriate public investment, right? It's not just a matter of taking money away from people. It's about, you know, creating opportunity such that people don't feel like they can't thrive in the system or their children are screwed because they weren't successful. And so they'll never have a chance. Right. Uh, so I think that's, you know, that's a matter of, uh, you know, public investment, not just in, uh, in uh, in education, but all kinds of things that give people access to good schools, as I said, but also you know healthcare, safety, 
uh, and, you know, opportunity. And then the third lever, you know what the third lever is? Um, the, uh, you know, I, I feel certainly in the United States, you know, we are dramatically under investing publicly in the kind of science and R&D and technology that actually was so critical to the U.S. productivity growth in the post-war period. And, you know, productivity growth itself solves lots and lots of problems. Like when productivity is rising, that creates new tax revenue, right? It lifts a lot of boats. It creates all kinds of possibility because when, you know, when the economic growth is rapid, you can do lots of things, right? Look at what China is doing, right? Their ability to make these just incredible investments in cities, in industries, in uh, high-speed rail, and so on comes from, you know, year-on-year growth rates of 7 8%, right? Uh, and uh, that comes, that, that type of productivity growth comes in part from investment in science and R&D and education, and then public uh, investment in those things and distributing them. So I think in the, in the United States in particular, our kind of paralysis and fear and, you know, and our combined with our, you know, multi-decade demonization of government as, you know, government can only do harm, get it out of the way, has prevented us from making the type of forward-looking forward looking investments that would create shared prosperity and would help to solve some of these problems through uh, rising national incomes. And do you think these distributional questions can be solved by taxation only, or should there be also some sort of element of democratizing of capital ownership? Um... I, I don't think it should be taxation only. I, you know, I, I think there should be, you know, in the U.S., we have an extreme kind of shareholder, uh, stakeholder model, right, where the only legitimate share, the only legitimate stakeholders in a public corporation are shareholders in the, you know, in the way that the problem is framed here. And I think that is a, a mistake relative to in Germany, where there's a view that of multi, multiple stakeholders of, you know, where workers are also stakeholders and there's a public stake. Uh, and I think that drives us to extreme set of choices that, you know, dramatically favor investment in, in capital over labor, that view workers, views workers as disposable, uh, and firms not having a responsibility for the fates of their workforces and so on. And uh, so, you know, even that kind of reorientation of that model could have important distributional benefits, important benefits in the sort of you know, whether, you know, we're all, you know, if we compare the U.S. to Germany, to Switzerland, to France, to Italy, to Portugal, you know, we're, we're all different variants on a spectrum of market economies from kind of, you know, cowboy capitalists in the United States to kind of cuddly capitalists in Norway and Scandinavia. Um, but it's, it's not, they're all, these are all market economies. And so uh, quite the question of how you want to shade them, in which direction, how much public investment, how much redistribution, how much, you know, who are the appropriate stakeholders, that has a big uh, impact on the way inequality and opportunity evolves and the degree to which people feel alienated from the, you know, the opportunities that are emerging versus, you know, likely beneficiaries of them. And I think that that contributes, I'm speculating, uh, to, you know, political satisfaction or dissatisfaction in the sense of whether we need to tear the system up and throw it away or, you know, uh, improve it further. So political economy matters. Hugely. Okay, David, thank you yeah. very much indeed for taking the time to talk to me okay. today. It was great. And pleasure Yeah, thank you very much. Talk to you okay. soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for having me on. Bye. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you don't miss future episodes by subscribing to Social Europe Podcast. You can also read our articles on www.socialeurope.eu and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Social Europe. Until next time.